investors and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley is Reid Hoffman. As an entrepreneur, he helped to build PayPal and he started LinkedIn. As an investor, he's been an early investor in Facebook and Airbnb, and now he's a partner in one of the leading venture firms in Silicon Valley. I had a chance to find out what the unique qualities it takes to be a great investor and a great entrepreneur in my conversation with Reid Hoffman. The venture capital world today seems like it can never get any better. Everybody seems to be making money, uh, the values are high, but the returns are very high. Can it get any better than this? And are you worried about this being a bubble, not unlike what we had in the tech bubble burst in 1999 and 2000? Well, I'm, you're always worried about the markets getting overinflated. Amount of stimulus, everything else is part of making this happen. And so I do think that there is some risk within the, the, the general market of this. Now, that being said, technology is accelerating the transformation of all industries. Uh, there's what artificial intelligence can do to all industries. There's obviously, you know, that's the leading edge of software. There's things happening with AR and VR. There's things happening with crypto and fintech. And so all of this area, I think, is, is very much accelerating in the future. And so I think that's part of the reason why the venture industry has been so good is because technology is important in redefining many key industries. Hey, now, Silicon Valley is not the only place in the United States where there are technology investments, but it seems like the Silicon Valley companies seem to be the most valuable, and that's where the most activity is occurring. Is there something about Silicon Valley that makes it unique and better than the other areas of interest in technology in the United States? Uh, there is. Silicon Valley itself has a number of overlapping network effects. It has a network effect of essentially being the, the hub by which a lot of uh, English-speaking entrepreneurs from around the world come to start their software businesses or key technology businesses. There's the hub for capital and the knowledge and investing that goes into it. There's a hub of talent for people growing these companies. It's part of the reason I wrote this book, Blitzscaling, for how, to, how, do, you, how do you build uh, technology companies at a global scale, lightning fast, and the, tech, the talent. There's, uh, there's network effects of learning and of sharing of information. And it's part of the reason why Silicon Valley, which you know has the whole Bay Area, has like three and a half million people tops. That's not the tech industry. And you know why half of the NASDAQ emerges out of Silicon Valley is for those kinds of reasons. And those network effects are what makes Silicon Valley great. What about around the world? Is China likely to catch up and pass uh, Silicon Valley as a leader of technology? Um, I think the one, it's one of the greatest concerns that Silicon Valley knowledgeable people have because China is amazing. It has huge amounts of tech talent. Everyone's acting like an immigrant, um, you know, with 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 hunger. Uh, like large companies have this policy: nine nine six. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, you're discoverable at your desk, and that's kind of like you know, you know, tens of thousands of tech, uh, people in technology companies, and um, they're doing a lot of innovation. Uh, there is there's things that we learn from from China, and so I think that that China is going to have one um, kind of. Uh, very strong creation of the technological future. Uh, it's one of the reasons why in Blitzscaling, we call it the land of Blitzscaling. Um, I think Silicon Valley has some edges too, but I think it's very much of a game on circumstance. Now, some people would say that the technology world in the United States is dominated by just a limited number of companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Microsoft. I'm um, sure you're familiar with all this. Do you think that, uh, the United States is dominated by too many, too few technology companies, and there should be, should be done, something should be done to kind of weaken their power, or do you think it's okay as it is? Well, what I think that we're heading to is we're going from five massive tech companies to 10. I think we're already naturally heading in that direction. You can see it with things like uh, Netflix and Salesforce and you know all of these other companies, which are continuing to also grow in strength and create a uh, a breadth of additional global, very strong technology companies. And as perspective as an investor, when you go around and you ask kind of what all the, you know, kind of the venture capitalists, they're like, no, no, we're, we're having more and more startups, more and more ability to create amazing new tech companies. So like, if anything, I think we're already naturally on that, trans uh, that trajectory. Do you think that large Chinese technology companies, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, ByteDance, and so forth, can have their technology become very dominant or important in the United States and around the world? And are we in a world now where we're competing with Chinese technology companies for market share outside of the United States and China? So I think we're already in that world. 
I think that if you look at kind of things that Alibaba is doing in terms of um, spreading the the Alipay and everything else into uh, South America, into Africa, you know, I think that the the notion of the technological platforms of the future are in deep, like the, the, there's a fast moving competition between companies in Silicon Valley and companies in China. And I think that's part of like, you know, which systems will be the systems that the world operates in is I think in deep competition. And that being said, I think we're already seeing uh, Chinese uh, platform companies beginning to make strong headroads into the US. Uh, ByteDance and TikTok is an obvious one, but I, you know, I think you already see it in also like drone manufacturer and DGI. There's a whole bunch that are already um, that are already getting massive global relevance, and you can see it already. And let's talk about the future, some things that people are interested in, in the, right now. One of them is cryptocurrencies. Are you a cryptocurrency uh, aficionado or not? I am. I actually, if, if you go to YouTube and search for Bitcoin rap battle, this is inspired by Alexander Hamilton, the musical. If this crypto system will be our salvation, it needs to be centralized, it needs regulation. If I ideated and then uh, funded and produced a rap battle uh, between Alexander Hamilton and Satoshi Nakamoto. And that's because I think there is a real role for cryptocurrencies in helping us evolve. So do you invest in cryptocurrencies yourself? I do. Okay. What about transportation? Are you a big believer in autonomous vehicles? I am. Um, I've invested in Aurora and Neuro um, uh, because actually, in fact, it's literally a question of when, not if, and how soon for when we have autonomous vehicles. It'll make all of our societies better. It will save you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of lives. It will enable a huge amount of increase in productivity. Uh, and so I think it's, it's, it's a great thing that we should be accelerating to as societies. Have you been in one of these cars where you were not the driver and you feel safe? Uh, I do, and I do. Um, look, I think part of the thing that all of them, uh, not just Aurora, not just Neuro, but all of them have safety, safety, safety is the very first thing. So when I've been in these cars where there is nobody in the, in the driver's seat, um, it's, it's, it's been good and fine. You wear a crash helmet when you're in those cars or? No. No, you don't. Okay. What about flying taxis? Is that something in our future? Uh, it is. Uh, as you know, I also uh, helped bring a Joby Public by SPAC, and it's moved the transport grid from 2D to 3D, redefine space in cities, uh, make commutes much less onerous, be reliable in getting to the airport on time, or be able to live, you know, kind of more uh, distantly remote, and then be able to come into the cities. And so I think the Jetsons is uh, now no longer science fiction, but en route to science fact. What about space? Do you invest in outer space related investments? Um, not as, as, as intensely as some of my friends like Elon, um, who obviously are in it. I've, I've put some money into SpaceX. That's more because, you know, Elon, this amazing transformation of the world. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's obviously an important area. Um, I've kind of ended up in it sometimes just by who I know. Let's talk about how you became an investor and an entrepreneur. You were gonna be an academic, and then I guess on a road to Damascus kind of uh, epiphany, you said, I'm not gonna be an academic, I'm gonna be something more important than an academic, I'm gonna be a, an investor. Well, Is actually, right? I didn't start with investor. It started with a product creator. I wasn't okay. even necessarily starting with entrepreneur. It was, how do we, think and speak better? How do we make ourselves better as individuals and as a group? Well, actually, this medium of software, this medium of constructing new products, um, it was kind of like I was just beginning to get that lens of what does the internet mean and how do we all work together and play together and live together using the internet to redefine our space and redefine our networks in order to be better. And, and I should go create that. Well, as you were starting this career, uh, you were invited to join a company that was called PayPal, and PayPal turned out to be a gigantic success, later sold to eBay. Uh, what was your job at PayPal? Well, so uh, when Peter Thiel and Max Levchin started PayPal, they each invited their friend who most understood and had entrepreneurial experience to be on the board. So that was me for Peter. And then um, after about a year of being on the board, uh, I was thinking about going and starting another company, and Peter said, no, come join um, uh, PayPal full time. 
uh, and help us because you know you've been helping us so much on the board and you understand this stuff, and and we have so much to do because PayPal was an early uh, blitzscaler. It, it its theory was it was going to be a bank, and that was not a that that was not a workable theory. Um, so we we had a great customer acquisition engine, but how do you redefine the payments OS was something that was all in front of it even as it was exponentiating its burn rate. So uh, so I joined PayPal full time, stepping off the board. All right, so PayPal was ultimately sold, as I mentioned, to eBay for about a billion and a half dollars or so. You got your share of the profits. You then became an angel investor. For those who don't know what an angel investor is, as opposed to a devil investor, what is an angel investor? <laughs> well, uh, I, sometimes there may be investors that entrepreneurs think are devil investors, although that's usually more post fact. Uh, angel investors are individuals, usually with some expertise in this area or some knowledge of the entrepreneur, that tend to invest of the earliest stages of a, of a company, uh, frequently, well, it's an idea on the back of a napkin or an entrepreneur just thinking about doing something, although that has all, like all investment has professionally scaled and does so kind of individually, um, not with a, a firm, the resources and assets of a firm, uh, the platform, the network that a firm brings. And so that was what I started doing, mostly just because I was interested in other folks who were uh, building these great projects that I wanted to help out with and participate in. Hey, when you started doing that, you did it relatively prolifically, and you became known as maybe the most active and maybe the most successful angel investor in Silicon Valley. One of the companies I think you invested in, was that Facebook? Yes. So what did you see in the young Mark Zuckerberg? Did you say this is going to be one of the great companies in the world, or you just said, I'll take a chance? So Facebook had already successfully launched a product that when it opened up a campus, because when, when I uh, did the investment, it was strictly only a uh, kind of a, a university campus, you know, network, not even, not, not the whole world. And, but when it opened up a campus in six weeks, 80% of the campus was using it six days, six times or more per day. And so you could just look at the, the usage curve and go, this is interesting. The person who's created this is really interesting. And even though back then Mark was very quiet, so had a tendency to, to not talk very much, um, long pauses, minutes long pauses in the conversation where you're like, is this conversation over? Um, you could see that he was very smart and you could see what was the trajectory that Facebook was on was really interesting. So let's talk about this. You're an angel investor. You're doing pretty well. People are coming to you all the time with deals and while you might miss one or two, basically you're doing quite well. Why did you join a firm called Greylock, an excellent venture capital firm, but why did you need to be joining a venture capital firm? You're already your own venture capitalist. You had enough money to start your own firm. Why would you join Greylock? So, um, not again, not surprising to the guy who co-founded LinkedIn, I think in networks, and I think in networks as platforms. And one of the things that I think those small number of very elite uh, venture capital firms uh, within Silicon Valley and other places do is create a network. And I was originally thinking about building my own. And then David Z and Anil Busri, um, who were then both uh, general partners at Greylock came to me and said, hey, we're, um, we're, we're in the process of moving the firm from Boston to Silicon Valley, where we're, it's kind of a, 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 a kind of a rebirth of the firm, which has this great set of investors and pedigree and culture and learnings and all these things that will be very helpful, but also this idea of network uh, uh, amplifier for venture capital. Um, we love it. We'd love to do it with you. And I was like, why? Well, these are these are people. I would be delighted to be partners with these folks. So let's let's build the firm here. Now, when you were starting at at Greylock, even though you had already had a good career as a venture investor and angel investor, I think one of the legends of Silicon Valley is the deal you wanted to do was Airbnb. Hmm. And the senior partner at your firm said, look, that's a terrible deal. It's going nowhere. Um, so were you intimidated by that because you had a lot of experience or, and how did you push that through? There's even more drama than your question suggests because the partner, the senior partner is David Z, who is, uh, a, uh, who's an amazing general partner, was my um, board member from Greylock at LinkedIn, uh, the reason I'm at Greylock. Um, and so I bring in Airbnb, it's my first uh, deal that I'm bringing into the partnership and David, 
you know, who I'm super close to, who I have deepest respect for, has has returned billions of dollars to the fund, looks at me and says, well, every VC has a, has a deal that they can learn from and fail from, and Airbnb can be yours. And so I was like, oh, David's super smart. And so ultimately, I kind of said, well, look, I have to have the conviction. This is a portfolio. I'm going to, uh, he, 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 he gave me uh, the hunting license, the permission to go do the deal. So I went and did the deal. Now, to David's credit, six months later, the numbers hadn't changed at all. He came back to me and said, I thought about it a lot. I think you were right. I was wrong. What did you see that I didn't see? And I said, well, all of the risk factors that you saw were correct. I just realized that if you, if you navigated through the risk factors, which I could see as able to do, then you would end up with a redefining company of an industry. It would be, you know, the, like the literally like you just, it, it, it transforms the entire industry. And that's the thing I saw. You had some time, I don't know where you got the time from, to start a little company called LinkedIn. The goal was building something that enabled every individual professional to most, to transform their career by collaborating within a network. In addition to venture investing, you had some time, I don't know where you got the time from, to start a little company called LinkedIn. Um, how did you have time to start a company called LinkedIn while you're a partner in a venture firm? Well, actually, I started it much earlier uh, okay. than, than Greylock. Um, that's actually how I met Greylock, because David Z led my Series B. Um, so I was doing angel investing while I was a uh, while I was the C, the the founding CEO and and co-founder of LinkedIn. But I didn't start venture investing until after I'd hired Jeff Weiner to be the CEO of LinkedIn. And LinkedIn uh, ultimately was sold to uh, Microsoft for roughly twenty six billion dollars or something like that. Uh, did you ever anticipate something like that when you started the company or helped to start the company? So um, one of the things to think about when you're strategizing, and it's like my first book, The Startup You, has this framework called ABZ planning, which is part of it is to think about the spread of outcomes. Like what's the, what's the great possible outcome? What's the worst outcome? What are the intermediate outcomes? What are the things that change the landscape of it? So I always knew that LinkedIn could be a network as a platform that would be transformative. And I also knew that it was the kind of thing that most aligned with Microsoft's mission. So did that mean that I knew that Microsoft was going to end up buying it for a, you know, for its, 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 its you know, kind of the largest acquisition uh, in its history? Or, um, and the answer is no. I thought it was a possibility. Uh, it, was, it was an outcome. It wasn't the goal. The goal was building something that enabled every individual professional to most to transform their career by collaborating within a network. All right, when you sold the company to Microsoft, you went on the board of Microsoft. Yes. And let me ask you about that. Microsoft was a technology company that came out of nowhere, became a dominant software company. Many people thought it would go south as it was you know, getting older and older. And it transformed itself when Satya Nadella became the CEO. Uh, were you shocked and surprised at how the company has become one of the most valuable companies in the world again? Uh, no, um, for a number of reasons. One is, Microsoft has always had an enormous amount of talent throughout the whole company. The technology depth, uh, Microsoft, you know, has actually created a whole range of products within not just the commercial side, but also Microsoft research. Um, and so there's always this raw amount of talent. And then obviously uh, having some key franchises like Office and Windows and other kinds of things and being willing to be bold and creation of uh, Xbox and the gaming franchise. Now, that being said, you know, that I'd say that the thing that Satya brought back with vigor to the company was a focus on earning the ability to 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 build the next generation of products, you know, starting with his own background in Azure, uh, but also kind of transforming across the com uh, the company a we are only one company in this universe and we are uh, uh, doing our absolute best to surprise and delight our customers. So let's talk about the different skill sets. It, to be an investor, you need a certain skill set. What is that skill set and what is a skill set and how is it different to be an entrepreneur? Hmm. So, well, I'll start with an entrepreneur because I think it's a little easier, which is, well, it, the, the, the game is hard, but the definition is easier, which is you have a, a vision for where the world is moving towards, where you can uh, help build it towards. Uh, uh, frequently in the case, uh, a new technology or a market shift or something that gives you that kind of market opportunity, you can assemble through your network the assets, not just capital, but talent, uh, the ability to build the pr new product or service. 
and you're driven by kind of the cadence of a complete focus on how do you and you know how do you navigate that path which can include pivoting includes risk management and a bunch of other things but it's that build of 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 building something from nothing and then in you know kind of blitz scaling getting it really large very fast as an investor what you're looking at is judging entrepreneurial talent in that same kind of circumstance of can this set of people can she or he uh or and you know sometimes better to have two or three founders do that run this uh this kind of the, this race and the key thing that's a difference between being the entrepreneur where it's kind of the all-in focus this is the only thing i'm doing and a an investor is that you're making the judge you're not running the race as the investor the the founders the entrepreneurs they are running the race you're helping as much as you can but you have to judge can they do that and then can you help them as best you can get there but it's it's the key uh, difference in skill so to make people feel good who aren't as successful as investors as you are uh do you have some failures you can tell us about where you <laughs> made a terrible mistake you lost all your money just to make the rest of us feel good uh well uh, it depends on you know do we have days i can go through the list uh, and actually by the way the interesting question about the analysis of here is not as much of the companies that you uh, that you invested in went to zero there's a large list of those companies that that did that the the real thing is the companies that uh you missed so like missing twitter missing snapchat missing pinterest those are in those are much worse outcomes than you put in you know a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or ten million dollars in this other company that went to zero so final question if somebody said i want to be the next reed hoffman a uh, person who's starting companies investing in companies doing good things for public policy what would you say is the best training ground to do that and how should somebody prepare to be the next reed hoffman well, I, I'm still young enough that I'm still hoping to be the next Reed Hoffman myself. Uh, but that being said, uh, there's a number of people who are like this within Silicon Valley who who bring an entrepreneur's mindset and entrepreneurial success together with an investing mindset and play a central role in the network. And many of these folks um, are folks that I work with. You know, um, you know, I could literally uh, spend another hour listing names. Um, you know, Ali Partovi at Neo, other other areas by which um, we collaborate with these folks. And so I think there's a, a lot of people out there who are all going to be the next themselves, you know, with this amazing kind of track record and luck. <laughs>